Good evening. We, the Zoom players from the faraway lands of New York, Rockland, Westchester, Connecticut, Massachusetts, California, and France, present to you a Midsummer's Night Dream. We begin. Now, fair Hippolyta, our nuptial hour draws on apace. Four happy days brings in another moon. But, oh, methinks how slow this old moon wanes. She lingers my desires like to a stepdane or a dowager, long withering out a young man revenue. Four days will quickly steep themselves in night. Four nights will quickly dream away the time. And then the moon, like to a silver bow, new bent in heaven, shall behold the night of our solemnities. Go, Philostrate. Stir up the Athenian youth to merriments. Awake the pert and nimble spirit of mirth. Turn melancholy forth to funerals. The pale companion is not for our pomp. Hippolyta, I wooed thee with, this, with my sword, and won thy love doing the injuries. But I will wed thee in another key, with pomp, with triumph, and with reveling. Enter Aegeus, Hermia, Lysander, and Demetrius. Happy be Theseus, our renowned duke. Thanks, good Aegeus. What's the news with thee? Uh, full of vexation come I with complaint against my child, my daughter Hermia. Stand forth, Demetrius. My noble lord, this man hath my consent to marry her. Stand forth, Lysander, and my gracious duke. This man hath bewitched the bosom of my child. Thou, thou, Lysander, thou, my child. Thou hast by moonlight at her window sung with feigning voice verses of feigning love and stolen the impression of her fantasy with bracelets of thy hair, rings, gods, conceits, knacks, trifles, nosegays, sweet meats, messengers of strong prevailment in unhardened youth. With cunning hast thou filched my daughter's heart, turned her obedience, which is due to me, to stubborn harshness, and my gracious duke, be it so, she will not Demetrius. I beg the ancient privilege of Athens. As she is mine, I may dispose of her, which shall be either to this gentleman or to her death, according to our law immediately provided in that case. What say you, Hermia? Be advised, fair maid, to you your father should be as a god, one that composed your beauties, yea, and one to whom you are but a form in wax, by him imprinted and within his power to leave the figure or disfigure it. Demetrius is a worthy gentleman. So is Lysander. And in himself he is. But in this kind, wanting your father's voice, the other must be held the worthier. I would my father looked, but with my eyes. Rather, your eyes must with his judgment look. I do entreat your grace to pardon me. I know not by what power I am made bold, nor how it may concern my modesty, in such a presence here to plead my thoughts. But I beseech your grace that I may know the worst that may befall me in this case if I refuse to wed Demetrius. Either to die the death or to abjure forever the society of men. Therefore, her fair Hermia, Question your desires, know of your youth, examine well your blood, whether if you yield not to your father's choice, you can endure the livery of a nun, for I to be in a shady cloister mewed, to live a barren sister all your life, chanting faint hymns to the cold fruitless moon. Thrice blessed they that masters sow their blood to undergo such maiden pilgrimage, but earthier happy is the rose distilled than that which the withering on the virgin thorn grows, lives, and dies in single blessedness. So will I grow, so live, so die, my lord. Ere I will my virgin patten up unto his lordship, whose unwished yoke my soul consents not to give sovereignty. Take time to pause, and by the next new moon, the sealing day betwixt my love and me for everlasting bond of fellowship. Upon that day, either prepare to die for disobedience to your father's will, or else to wed Demetrius as he would, or on Diana's altar to protest for I austerity and single life. Relent, sweet Hermia, and Lysander, yield thy crazed title to my certain right. You have her father's love, Demetrius, 
Let me have Hermia's. Do you marry him? Scornful Lysander, true he hath my love. And what is mine, my love shall render him. And she is mine, and all my right of her I do estate to Demetrius. I am, my lord, as well derived as he, as well possessed. My love is more than his. My fortune's every way as fairly ranked, if not with vantage, as Demetrius's. And, which is more than all these boasts can be, I am beloved of beauteous Her Hermia. Why should I not then pros prosecute my right, Demetrius? I'll avouch it to his head. Made love to Netta's daughter, Helena, and won her soul. And she, sweet lady, dotes, devoutly dotes, dotes in idolatry upon this spotted and inconstant man. I must confess that I have heard so much and with Demetrius thought to have spoke thereof. But being over full of self-affairs, my mind did lose it. But, Demetrius, come, and come, Magius. I have some private schooling for you both. For you, fair Hermia, look you on yourself to fit your fancies to your father's will, or else the law of Athens yields you up, which by no means we may extenuate, to death or to a vow of single life. Come, my Hippolyta, what cheer, my love, Demetrius and Aegeus, go along. I must employ you in some business against our nuptial and confer with you of something nearly that concerns yourselves. With duty and desire we follow you. Exit all but Lysander and Hermia. How oh, now, my love? Why is your cheek so pale? How chance the roses there do fade so fast? You like for want of rain, which I could well between them from the tempest of my eyes. Ay, me, for aught that I could ever read, could ever hear by tale or history, the course of true love never did run smooth. But either it was different in blood. No cross, too high to be enthralled. Or else misgraft in respect of years. Oh, spite, too old to be engaged to young. Or else it stood upon the choice of friends. Oh, hell, to choose love by another's eyes. Or if there were a sympathy in choice, war, death, or sickness, did they siege to it, making it momentary as a sound, swift as a shadow, short as any dream, brief as the lightning in the colleague night that in a spleen unfolds both heaven and earth, and ere a man hath power to say, Behold, the jaws of darkness do devour it up, so quick bright things come to confusion. If then true lovers have, have been ever crossed, it stands as an edict in destiny. Then let us teach our child patience, because it is a customary cross, as due to love as thoughts and dreams and sighs, wishes and tears, poor fancies followers. A good persuasion. Therefore, hear me, Hermia. I have a widowed aunt, a dowager, of great revenue, and she hath no child. From Athens is her house remote seven leagues, and she respects me as her only son. There, gentle Hermia, may I marry thee, and to that place the sharp Athenian law cannot pursue us. If thou lovest me then, steal forth thy father's house tomorrow night, and in a wood, a league with the town, where I did meet thee once with Helena to do observance to a morn of May, there will I stay for thee. My good Lysander, I swear to thee by Cupid's strongest bow, by his best arrow with the golden head, by the simplicity of Venus's doves, by that which knitteth souls and prospers loves, and by that fire which burned the Carthage queen, when the false Trojan under Sal was seen, by all the vows that ever men have broke, in number more than ever women smoke, spoke, in that same place thou hast appointed me. Tomorrow truly will I meet with thee. Keep promise, love. Look, here comes Helena. Enter Helena. Godspeed, fair Helena. Whither away? Call you me fair? That fair again unsay. Demetrius loves thy fair. Oh, happy fair. And your eyes are load stars, and your tongue sweet air, more tunable than a lark to a shepherd's ear. When wheat is green, when hawthorn buds appear, Sickness is catching. Oh, were favor so yours would I catch, fair Helen, for her, fair Hermia. Ere I go, my ear would catch your voice, my eye your eye. My tongue should catch your tongue's sweet melody. Were the world mine, Demetrius being baited, the rest I'd give to be your, you translated. Oh, teach me how you look, and with what art you may sway the motion of Demetrius's heart. I frown upon him, yet he loves me still. 
Oh, that your frowns would teach my smiles such skill. I give him curses, yet he gives me love. Oh, that my prayers could such affection move. The more I hate, the more he follows me. And the more I love, the more he hateth me. His folly, Helena, is no fault of mine. None but your beauty would that fault mine. Take comfort, he no more shall see my face. Lysander and myself will fly this place. Before the times I did Lysander see seemed Athens as a paradise to me. Oh, then what grace in my love do dwell that he hath turned a heaven unto a hell. Helen, to you our minds we will unfold. Tomorrow night, when Phoebe doth behold her sil silver visage in the watery glass, decking with liquid pearl the bladed grass, a time that lover's flights doth still conceal, through Athens' gates have we devised to steal. And in the wood where often you and I upon faint primrose beds were wont to lie, emptying our bosoms of their counsel sweet, there my Lysander and myself shall meet. And thence from Athens turn away our eyes to seek new friends and strangers, stranger companies. Farewell, sweet playfellow. Pray thou for us. And good luck grant thee thy Demetrius. Keep word, Lysander, we must starve our sight from lover's food till morrow deep midnight. I will, my Hermia. Thanks. Helena, adieu. Mm -hmm. As you on him, Demetrius dote on you. Exit. How happy some, how happy some or other some can be. Through Athens am I thought as fair as she. But what of that? Demetrius thinks not so. He will not know what all but he do know. And he, as he does, and as he errs, doting on Hermia's eyes, so I, admiring of his qualities, things base and vile, folding no quantity, love can trust transpose to form and dignity. Love looks not with the eyes, but with the mind, therefore as winged Cupid painted blind. Nor hath love's mind of any judgment taste wings and no eyes of fair figure unheedy haste. And therefore is love to set, said to be a child, because in no choices he oft is so oft beguiled. As waggish boys in games themselves forswear, so the boy love is perjured everywhere. For ere Demetrius looked on Hermia's eye, he hailed down oaths that he was only mine. And when his hail some heat from Hermia felt, so he, he dissolved and showers of oaths did melt. I will go tell him of fair Hermia's flight. Then to the wood will he go tomorrow night, pursue her, and for his intelligence, if I have thanks, it is a dear expense. But herein mean I to enrich my pain, to have his flight thither and back again. Scene two, Athens, Quince's house. Enter Quince, snug, <clears throat> bottom, flute, snout, and starveling. Is all our company here? You are best to call them generally, man by man. Uh, here is the scroll of every man's name, which is thought through all of Athens to play in our interlude before the Duke and the Duchess on his wedding day at night. Good Peter Quince, say what the play treats on, then read the names of the actors and so grow to a point. Oh, well, Mary, our play is the most lamentable comedy and most cruel death of Pyramus and Thisbe. A very good piece of work, I assure you, a and a merry. Now, good Peter Quince, call forth your actors by the scroll. Master, spread yourselves. Answer as I call you. Uh, Nick Bottom, the weaver. Ready. Name what part I am for and proceed. You, Nick Bottom, are set down for Pyramus. What is Pyramus? A lover or a tyrant? A lover that kills himself most gallant for love. That will ask some tears in the true performing of it. If I do it, let the audience look to the eyes. I will move storms. I will condole in some measure. To the rest, yet my chief humor is for a tyrant. I could play Heracles rarely, or a part to tear a cat in to make all split. The raging rocks, the shivering shocks, the, shall break the locks of prison gates, and Phoebus' ear shall shine from far and make and mar the foolish fates. This was lofty. Now name the rest of the players. This is Ericles' vein, a tyrant's vein. A lover is more condoling. Ah. Francis Flute, the bellows mender. Uh, here, Peter Quince. Flute, 
you must take Thisbe on you. Ah, uh, what is Thisbe? A wandering knight? It is the lady that Pyramus must love. Oh, nay, Faith, let me play not a woman. I have a beard coming. That's all one. You shall play it in a mask, and you may speak as small as you will. And I may hide my face. Let me play Thisbe too. I'll speak in a monstrous <laughs> little voice. This knee, this knee, I promise, dear lover, thy Thisbe dear and lady dear. No, no, you must play Thisbe and flute, uh, you, no, so you must play Pyramus and flute, you Thisbe. Well, proceed. Robin Starveling, the tailor. Dear Peter Quince. Robin Starveling, you must play Thisbe's mother. Tom Snap, the tinker. Dear Peter Quince. You, Pyramus's father. Myself, Thisbe's father. Snug, the joiner. You, the lion's part. And I hope here is a play fitted. Have you the lion's part written? Pray you, if it be, give it to me, for I am slow of study. You may do it extempore, for it is nothing but roaring. Let me play the lion too. I will roar, that, that I will do any man's heart good to hear me. I will roar, that I will make the duke say, let him roar again, let him roar again. And you should do it too terribly. You would fright the duchess and all the ladies and they would shriek and that would hang us all. That would hang us, would hang us. Oh, every every other son. I grant you friends, if that you should fright the ladies out of would have no more discretion but to hang us. But I will aggravate, aggravate my voice so that I will roar you as gently as any sucking dove. I will roar you as twere any nightingale. You can play no part but this Pyramus, for Pyramus is a sweet-faced man, a proper man, as one shall see in a summer's day, a most lovely gentleman-like man. Therefore, you must need play Pyramus. Well, I will undertake it. What beard were I best to play it in? Why, what you will. I will discharge it in either your straw color beard, your orange tawny beard, your purple ingrained beard, or your French crown color beard, your perfect yellow. Some of your French crowns have no hair at all because syphilis. And then you will be placed, have to play barefaced. But masters, here are your parts. And I am entreat you, request you, and desire you to con them by tomorrow night and meet me in the palace wood a mile without the town by moonlight and there will we rehearse for if you meet in the city we shall be dogged with company and our devices known in the meantime i will draw a bill of properties uh, such as our play once uh oh, i pray you fail me not we will meet and there we may rehearse most obscenely and courageously take pains be perfect i do at the Duke's Oak we meet. Enough, hold or cut bowstrings. Scene one, a wood near Athens. Enter from opposite sides, a fairy and Puck. How now, spirit, whither wander you? That's not what we were supposed to do. I think that's why it stopped, right? We were supposed to pause and- Yeah, hold on. Yeah, sorry, I, that, that, that's all act one, isn't it? Sorry, that caught me by surprise. Hi, everybody. Oh, let me see my mic's on. Yeah, act two. Oops. Oh my God. Sorry. Hold on. Sorry. Um, hold on. Let me pause. Act two, scene one, a wood near Athens. Enter from opposite sides a fairy and puck. How now, spirit? Whither wander you? Over hill, over dale, through a bush, through a briar, over park, over pale, through a flood, through a fire. I do wander everywhere, swifter than the moon's sphere, and I serve the fairy queen, and to do her orbs around the green. The cowslips tall her pensioners be, in their gold coat spots you see. Those be rubies, fairy favors, in those freckles live their savors. I must go seek some dewdrops here, and hang a pearl in every cowslip's ear. Farewell, thou lava of spirits, I'll be gone. Our queen and all our elves come here and on. The king doth keep his revels here tonight. Take heed the queen, come not within his sight, for Oberon is passing fell and wrath, because that she, as her attendant, hath a lovely boy, stolen from an Indian king. She never had so sweet a changeling, and jealous Oberon would have the child knight of his train to trace the forest wild, but she perforce withholds the loved boy. 
crowns him with flowers and makes him all her joy. And now they never meet in grove or green, by fountain clear or spangled starlight sheen, but they do square that all of their elves for fear creep into acorn cups and hide them there. Either I mistake your shape and making quite, or else you are shrewd and knavish sprite, called Robin Goodfellow. Are not you he that frights the maidens of the villagery? Skim milk and sometimes labors in the quern, and bootless make the breathless housewives churn, and sometimes make the drink no bear no barm, mislead night wanderers laughing at their harm. Those that hobgoblin call you, and sweet puck, you do their work, and they shall have good luck. Are not you he? Thou speakest to right. I am that merry wanderer of the night. I jest to Oberon and make him smile, when I, a fat and bean-fed horse beguile, neighing in likeness of a filly foal, and sometime lurk I in a gossip's bowl in very likeness of a roasted crab. <laughs> and when she drinks against her lips, I bob and on her withered dewlap pour the ale. <laughs> The wisest ant, telling the saddest tale, sometime for three-foot stool, mistaketh me. Then I slip from her bum, down topples she, and Taylor cries and falls into a cough. And then the whole choir hold their lips and laugh, and waxen in their mirth, and knees and swear, a merrier hour was never wasted there. But room fairy, here comes Oberon. And here my mistress, would that he were gone. Enter from one side Oberon with his train, from the other Titania with hers. Ill met by moonlight, proud Titania. What, jealous Oberon? Fairy skip hence. I have forsworn his bed and company. Terry rash wanton, am I not thy lord? Then I must be thy lady, but I know when thou hast stolen away from fairyland, and in the shape of corn sat all day, playing on pipes of corn and versing love to amorous Phyllida. Why art thou here, come from the farthest step of India? But that forsooth the bouncing Amazon, your buck-skinned mistress and your warrior love, to Theseus must be wedded, and you come to give their bed joy and prosperity. How canst thou thus for shame, Titania, glance at my credit with Hippolyta, knowing I know thy love to Theseus? Didst thou not lead him through the glimmering night from Perigene of whom he ravished? and make with him fair eagle break his faith with Ariadne and Antiopa? These are the forgeries of jealousy. And <laughs> never since the midnight, middle summer's spring met we on hill, in dale, forest, or mead, by paved fountain, or by rushy brook, or in the beached margin of the sea, to dance our ringlets to the whistling wind. But with thy brawls thou hast disturbed our sport, Therefore the winds, piping to us in vain, as in revenge have sucked up from the sea contagious fogs, which falling in the land have made every pelting river made so proud that they have overborne their continents. The ax hath therefore stretched his yoke in vain, the plowman lost his sweat, and the green corn has rotted ere his youth attained a beard. The fold stands empty in the drowned field, and crows are fatted with the murrian flock. The nine men's morris is filled up with mud, and the quaint mazes in the wanton green for lack of tread are indistinguishable. The human mortals want their winter here. No night is now with him or Carol blessed. Therefore the moon, governess of floods, pale in her anger, washes all the air that rheumatic diseases do abound. And through this temp distemperature, we see the seasons alter hoary-headed frosts far in the fresh lap of the crimson rose, and on Oldheim's thin and icy crown, an odorous chaplet of sweet summer buds is as in mockery set. The spring, the summer, the childing autumn, angry winter change their wanted liveries, and the mazed world by their increase now knows not which is which. And the same progeny of evils comes from our debate, from our dissension, we are their parents and original. Do you amend it then? It lies in you. Why should Titania cross her Oberon? I do but beg a little changeling boy to be my henchman. Set your heart at rest. The fairyland buys not the child of me. 
His mother was a votaress of my order, and in the spiced Indian air by night, full often hath she gossiped by my side, and sat with me on Neptune's yellow sands, marking the embarked traders on the flood, when we have laughed to see the sails conceive and grow big bellied with the wanton wind, which she, with pretty and with swimming gait following, her womb then rich with my young squire, would imitate and sail upon the land to fetch me trifles and return again as from a voyage rich with merchandise. But she, being mortal, of that boy did die, and for her sake do I rear up her boy, and for her sake I will not part with him. How long within this would intend you stay? Perchance till after Theseus' wedding day, if you will patiently dance in our round and see our moonlight revels, go with us. If not, shun me, and I will spare your haunts. Give me that boy, and I will go with thee. Not for thy fairy kingdom. Fairies away, we shall chide downright if I longer stay. Exit Titania with her train. Well, go thy way. Thou shalt not from this grove till I torment thee for this injury. My gentle Puck, come hither. Thou rememberest, since once I sat upon a promontory and heard a mermaid on a dolphin's back uttering such dulcet and harmonious breath that the rude sea grew civil at her song and certain stars shot madly from their spheres to hear the sea maid's music. I remember. That very time I saw, but thou couldst not, flying between the cold moon and the earth, Cupid, all armed. A certain aim he took at a fair vestal thrown by the west and loosed his love shaft smartly from his bow as it should pierce a hundred thousand hearts. But I might see Cupid's fiery shaft quenched in the chaste beams of the watery moon and the imperial votaress pass on in maiden meditation, fancy free. Yet marked I where the bolt of Cupid fell. It fell upon a little western flower before milk white, now purple with love's wound, and maidens call it Love in idleness. Fetch me that flower, the herb I showed thee once. The juice of it on sleeping eye laid will make a man or woman madly dote upon the next li live creature that it sees. Fetch me this herb, and be thou here again ere the Leviathan can swim a league. I'll put a girdle round about the earth in 40 minutes. Exit. <laughs> Having once this juice, I'll watch Titania where she's asleep and drop the liquor of it in her eyes. The next thing she, then she waking looks upon be it on lion, bear, or wolf, or bull, on meddling monkey, or on busy ape, shall she pursue with the soul of love. And ere I take this charm off her sight, as I can take it with another herb, I'll make her render up her page to me. But who comes? I am invisible and will overhear her conference. Enter Demetrius, Helena following him. I love thee not, therefore pursue me not. Where is Lysander and Perhermia? The one I'll slay, the other slayeth me. Thou toldst me they were stolen unto this wood, and here am I, and woed within this wood, because I cannot meet my Hermia. Hence, get thee gone, and follow me no more. You draw me, you hard-hearted adamant, but yet you draw not iron, for my heart is true as steel. Leave you your power to draw, and I shall have no power but to follow you. Do I entice you? Do I speak you fair? Or rather, do I, not in plainest truth, tell you I do not, nor not, or nor I cannot love you? And even for that do I love you more. I am your spaniel, and Demetrius, the more you beat me, I will fawn on you. Use me but as your spaniel, spurn me, strike me, neglect me, lose me. Only give me leave, unworthy as I am, to follow you. What worse place can I beg in your love, and yet a place of high respect with me? than to be used as you use your dog. Tempt not too much the hatred of my spirit, for I am sick when I do look on thee. And I am sick when I look not on you. You do impeach your modesty too much to leave the city and commit yourself into the hands of one that loves you not, to trust the opportunity of night and the ill counsel of a desert place with the rich worthy of your virginity. Your virtue is my privilege, for that it is not night when I do see your face. Therefore, I think I am not in the night, nor doth this wood lack the worlds of company, for you in my respect are all the world. And then how can, I, how can it be said that I am alone when all the world is here to look at me? 
I'll run from thee and hide me in the brakes and leave thee to the mercy of these wild beasts. The wildest hath not such a, a heart as you. Run when you will, the story shall be changed. Apollo flies and Daphne holds the chase. The dove pursues the griffin. The mild hind makes speech to catch the tiger. Bootless speed when cowardice pursues and valor flies. I will not stay thy questions. Let me go. Or, if thou follow me, do not believe, but I shall do thee mischief in the wood. I and in the temple, in the town, the field, you do me mischief. Fie, Demetrius, your wrongs do set a scandal on my sex. We cannot fight for love as men we do. We should be wooed when we were not made to woo. Exit Demetrius. I, I'll follow thee and make a heaven of hell to die upon the hand I love so well. Exit. Fare thee well, nymph. Ere he do leave this grove, thou shalt fly him, and he shall seek thy love. Re-enter Puck. Hast thou the flower there? Welcome, wanderer. I, there it is. I pray thee, give it me. I know a bank where the wild thyme blows, where ox lips and the nodding violet grows, quite over canopied with luscious woodbine, with sweet musk roses and with elegant thyme. There sleeps Titania sometime of the night, lulled in these flowers with dances and delight. And there the snake throws upon her emerald skin, weed wide enough to wrap a fairy in. And with the juice of this, I'll streak her eyes and make her full of hateful fantasies. Take thou some of it and seek through this grove a sweet Athenian lady in love with a disdainful youth. Anoint his eyes, but do it when the next thing he espies may be the lady. Thou shalt know the man by the Athenian garments he hath on, affected with some care that he may prove more fond on her than she upon her love. And look thou meet me ere the first cock crow. Fear not, my lord. Your servant shall do so. Exeunt. Scene two, another part of the wood. Enter Titania with her train. Come, now, a roundel and a fairy song. Then for the third part of a minute hence, some to kill cankers in the musk rose buds, some war with rear mice for their leathern wings to make my small elves coat and some keep pack the clamorous owl that nightly hoots and wanders as our, at our quaint spirits. Sing me now asleep, then to your offices, and let me rest. The fairy sing. You spotted snakes with double tongue, thorny hedgehogs be not seen, newts and blind words do no wrong, come not near our fairy queen. Philomel with sweet lullaby, sing in our sweet lullaby, la 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 lullaby. Do you have a song there, Serpy? <laughs> um, I, I did, but then it went away, but music can't sync with this anyway, so go okay. ahead. Never harm, nor spell, nor charm, come near our lovely lady nigh. So good night with sweet lullaby, weaving spiders, come not here, hence you long-legged spinners, hence. Beetles black, approach not near, worm nor snail, do no offense, Philomel, etc., etc. Hence away, now all is well, one aloof stands sentinel. Exeunt fairies, Titania sleeps. Enter Oberon and squeezes the flower on Titania's eyelids. What thou seest when thou dost wake, do it for thy true love take. Love and languish for his sake, be it ounce or cat or bear, pard or boar with bristled hair. In thy eye that thou shall appear when thou wakest, it is thy dear. Wake when some vile thing is near. Exit. Enter Lysander and Hermia. Fair love, you faint with wandering in the wood. And to speak troth, I have forgot our way. We'll rest thus, Hermia, if you think it good, and tarry for the comfort of the day. Be it so, Lysander. Find you out a bed, for I upon this bank will rest my head. One turf shall serve as a pillow for us both. One heart, one bed, two bosoms, and one troth. Nay, good Lysander, for my sake, my dear, lie further off yet. Do not lie so near. Oh, take the sand, sweet, of my innocence. Love takes the meaning in love's conference. I mean that my heart unto yours is knit, so that but one heart we can make of it. Two bosoms interchanged with an oath, so then two bosoms and a single troth. Then by your side no bedroom me deny for lying so, Hermia. I do not lie. Lysander riddles very prettily. Now much beshrew my manners and my pride, if Hermia meant to say Lysander lied. 
But gentle friend, for loving courtesy, lie further off in human modesty. Such separation, as may well be said, becomes a virtuous bachelor and a maid. So far be distant, and good night, sweet friend. Thy love ne'er alter till thy sweet life end. Amen. Amen to that fair prayer, say I. And then in life, when I end loyalty, here is my bed, sleep give thee all his rest. With half that wish, the wisher's eyes be pressed. They sleep, enter Puck. Through the forest have I gone, but Athenian found I none, on whose eyes I might approve this flower's force in stirring love. Night and silence. Who is here? Weeds of Athens he doth wear. Th this is he, my master said, despise the Athenian maid, and, and hear the maiden sleeping sound on the dank and dirty ground. Pretty soul, she durst not lie near this lack love, this kill courtesy. Churl, upon thy eyes I throw all the power this charm doth owe. When thou wakest, let love forbid sleep his seat on thy eyelid. So awake when I am gone. For I must now to Oberon. Exit. Enter Demetrius and Helena, running. Stay though thou kill me, sweet Demetrius. I charge thee hence, and do not haunt me thus. Oh, wilt thou darkling leave me? Do not so. Stay on thy peril. I alone will go. Exit. Oh, I am out of breath in this fond chase. The more my prayer, the less there is my grace. Happy is Hermia, wheresoe'er she lies, for she hath blessed and attractive eyes. How came her eyes so bright, not with salt tears? So my eyes are oftener washed than hers. No, no, I am as ugly as a bear, for beasts that meet me run away for fear. Therefore no marvel, though Demetrius do, as the monster fly my presence thus, what wicked and dissembling glass of mine made me compare with Hermia's sphery eyne? But who is here? Lysander? On the ground? Dead? Or asleep? I see no blood, no wound. Lysander, if you live, good sir, awake! And run through fire, I will, for thy sweet sake. Transparent Helena. Nature shows art that through thy bosom makes me see thy heart. Where is Demetrius? Oh, how fit a word is that vile name to perish on my sword. Do not say so, Lysander, say not so. What though he love your Hermia? Lord, what though? Yet Hermia still loves you, then be content. Content with Hermia? <laughs> no, I, I do repent the tedious minutes I with have her spent, not Hermia. But Helena I love, who will not charge a raven for a dove? The will of man is by his reason swayed. And reason says that you are the worthier maid. Things growing are not ripe until their season. So I, being young, tell now ripe not to reason. And touching now the point of human skill, reason becomes the marshal to my will. And leads me to your eyes, where I overlook love stories written in love's richest book. Wherefore was I to this keen mockery born? When at your hands did I deserve this scorn? It's not enough, it's not enough, young man, that I did never know nor never can deserve a sweet look from Demetrius' eye, but you must flout my insufficiency? Good truth, you do me wrong. Good sooth, you do, in such disdainful manner to, disdainful manner me to woo. But fare you well, perforce I must confess, I thought you lord of more true gentleness. Oh, that a lady of one man refused, should of another therefore be abused. Exit. She sees not Hermia. Hermia, sleep thou there, and never mayst thou come, Lysander, near, for as a surfeit of the sweetest things, the deepest loathing to the stomach brings, or as tie here sees that men do lead, or hated most of those they did deceive. So thou, my surfeit and my heresy, of all be hated, but the most of me. 
and all my powers address your love and might to honor Helen and to be her knight. Exit. Help me, Lysander, help me do thy best to pluck this crawling serpent from my breast. I am me for pity. Oh, what a dream was here. Lysander, look how I do quake with fear. Methought a serpent eat my heart away. And you sat smiling at his cruel prey. Lysander? What, removed? Lysander! Lord! What, what, out of hearing? Gone? No sound, no word? Alack, where are you? Speak! And if you hear, speak of all loves! I swoon almost with fear. No? Then I well perceive you all not nigh, either death or you I'll find immediately. Exit. Act three, scene one, the wood, Titania lying asleep. Enter Quince, Snug, Bottom, Flute, Snout, and Starveling. Are we all met? Pat, pat, and here's a marvelous convenient place for our rehearsal. This green plot shall be our stage, this hawthorn bush our, our tiring house, and we will do it in action as we will do it before the Duke. Peter Quince. What sayest thou, Bully Bottom? There are things in this comedy of Pyramus and Thisbe that will never please. First, Pyramus must draw a sword to kill himself, which the ladies cannot abide. How answer you that? <clears throat> By our lark like in a perilous fear. Starveling. So you starveling? Sorry, it was muted. Uh, I believe we must kill, leave the killing out when all is done. Not a whit. I have a device to make all well. Write me a prologue, and let the prologue seem to say we will do no harm with our swords, and that Pyramus is not killed indeed, and for the more bitter assurance, tell them that I, Pyramus, am not Pyramus, but Bottom the Weaver. This will put them out of fear. Well, we will have such a prologue, and it will be written in six and eight. No, make it two more. Let it be written in eight and eight. Will not the ladies be afeard of the lion? I fear it, I promise you. Masters, you are to consider with yourself you are to consider with yourselves. To bring in God shield us, a lion among ladies is the most dreadful thing. For there is for 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 there is not a more dreadful wild fowl than your li lion living. Uh, and we ought to look to it. Therefore another prologue must tell he is not a lion. Nay, you must name his name, and half his face must be seen through the lion's neck, and he himself must speak through, saying thus, or, or to the same effect, ladies, or fair ladies, I, I wish you, or I would request you, or I would entreat you, not to fear, not to tremble my life for yours. If you think I come hither as a lion, it were pity of my life. No, I am no such thing. I am a man, as are other men. And there indeed, let him name his name, and tell them plainly, he is Snug the Joiner. Well, <clears throat> it shall be so. But there is two hard things. That is, to bring the moonlight into the chamber. For you know Pyramus and Thisbe did meet by moonlight. Doth the moon shine that night we play our play? A calendar! A calendar! Look in the almanac! Find out moonshine! Find out moonshine! Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, it doth shine that night. Why, then you may leave a casement of the great chamber window, window where we play open, and the moon may shine in at the casement. Aye, or else one must come in with a bush of thorns and a lantern and say he comes to disfigure or, or to present the person of moonshine. And, th and then there is another thing. Um, we must have a wall in the great chamber for Pyramus and Thisbe says the story did talk through the chink in a wall. Never bring in a wall. What say you, Bottom? Some man or other must present wall and let him have some plaster or some loam or some rough cast about him to signify wall and let him hold his fingers thus. And through that cranny shall Pyramus and Thisbe whisper. If that may be, then all is well. Come, sit down every mother's son and rehearse your parts. Pyramus, you begin. When you have spoken your speech, enter into that break. And so everyone according to his cue. Enter Puck behind. 
What hempen homespuns have we swaggering here, so near the cradle of the fairy queen? <sighs> what a play toward? I'll be an auditor. Uh, an actor, too, perhaps, if I see cause. <laughs> Speak, Paramus. Thisbe, stand forth. Thisbe, the flowers of odious savors sweet. Odors. Odors. O odors, savors sweet. So hath thy breath, my dearest Thisbe dear. But hark a voice. Stay thou, but here a while, and by and by I will to thee appear. That's it. Ranger Pyramus than ever played here. Exit. Must I speak now? Ah, Mary, you must. Uh, you must understand. He goes but to see that noise he has heard, and it's to come again. <clears throat> most radius Pyramus, most lily white of hue, of color like the red rose on triumphant briar, most brisky juvenile and eke most lovely Jew, as true as truest horse that yet would never tire, I'll meet thee, Pyramus, at Ninny's tomb. Ninus tomb, man. Why, you must not speak that yet. You, that you speak to Pyramus. You speak all your part at once, cues and all. Uh, Pyramus, enter, your cue is past, it is never tire. Oh, as true as truest horse, that yet would never tire. We enter Puck and bottom with an ass's head. If I were fair Thisbe, I were only thine. Oh, monstrous, oh strange, we are haunted. Pray, masters, fly, masters, fly, help! <laughs> Exeunt Quince, Snug, Flute, Snout, and Starveling. I'll follow you. I'll lead you about a round through bog, through bush, through brake, through briar. Sometime a horse I'll be, sometime a hound, a hog, a headless bear, sometime a fire. <laughs> and neigh, and bark, and grunt, and roar, and burn like horse, hound, hog, bear, fire at every turn. Why do they, oh, why do they run away? This is, a, this is a knavery of them to make me afeard. We enter snout. Oh, bottom, thou art changed. What do I see on me? What What do you see? You see an ass head of your own, do you? Exit uh, smoothly into Quince. Bless thee, bottom. Bless thee, thou art translated. Exit. <laughs> I see their knavery. This is to make an ass of me, to fright me if they could. But I will not stir from this place. Do what they can. I will walk up and down here and I will see. That they shall that they shall hear. I am not afraid. The also cock so black of hue with orange tawny bill, the throstle with his note so true, the wren with little quill. What angel wakes me from my flowery bed? The finch, the sparrow, and the lark, the plain song cuckoo gray, whose note full many a man doth mark, and dares not answer nay. For indeed, who would set his wit to so foolish a bird, who would give the bird a lie, though he cry, cuckoo never so. I pray thee, gentle mortal, sing again. Mine ear is much enamored of thy note. So is mine eye enthralled to thy shape, and thy fair virtue's force perforce doth move me on the first view to say, to swear, I love thee. Methinks, mistress, you should have little reason for that. And yet, to say the truth, reason and love keep little company together nowadays. The more the pity that some honest neighbors will not make them friends. Nay, I can gleek upon occasion. Thou art as wise as thou art beautiful. Not so, neither. But if I had wit enough to get out of this wood, I had enough to serve mine own turn. Out of this wood do not desire to go. Thou shalt remain here, whether thou wilt or no. I am a spirit of no common rate. The summer still doth tend upon my state. And I do love thee. Therefore, go with me. I'll give thee fairies to attend on thee, and they shall fetch thee jewels from the deep and sing while thou on pressed flowers dost sleep. 
and I will purge thy mortal grossness so that thou shalt like an airy spirit go. Peace blossom, cobweb, moth, and mustard seed. And I. I. And I. And I. And I. Where shall, Where we, shall we go? Be kind and courteous to this gentleman. Hop in his walks and gamble in his eyes. Feed him with apricots and dewberries, with purple grapes, green figs, and mulberries. The honey bags steal from the humblebees, and for night tapers, crop thy waxen thighs and light them at the fiery glowworm's eyes to have my love to bed and to arise and pluck the wings from painted butterflies to fan the moonbeams from his sleeping eyes. Nod to him, elves, and do him courtesies. Hail, mortal! Hail! 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 I cry your worship's mercy heartily. I beseech your worship's name. Cobweb. I shall desire you of more acquaintance. Good master Cobweb, if I cut my finger, I shall make with I shall make bold with you. Your name, honest gentleman? He's blossom. I pray you commend me to Mistress Squash, your mother, and to Master Peascod, your father. Good Master Peasel Blossom, I shall desire you of more acquaintance too. Your name, I beseech you, sir. Mustard Seed. Good Master Mustard Seed, I know your patience well. That same cowardly giant like ox beef hath devoured many a gentleman of your house. I promise you, your kindred has made mine eyes water ere now. I desire more acquaintance, good Master Mustard Seed. Come, wait upon him. Lead him to my bower. The moon, methinks, looks with a watery eye, and when she weeps, weeps every little flower, lamenting some enforced chastity. Tie up my love's tongue. Bring him silently. Exeunt. Scene two, another part of the wood. Enter Oberon. I wonder if Titania be awaked. Then what is it, what, then what it was that next came into her eye, which she must dote on in extremity? Enter Puck. Here comes my messenger. How now, mad spirit? What night rule now about this haunted grove? <laughs> my mistress with a monster is in love. <laughs> Near to her close and consecrated bower, while she was in her dull and sleeping hour, a crew of patches, rude mechanicals that work for bread upon Athenian stalls, were met together to rehearse a play intended for great Theseus's nuptial day. The shallowest thick skin of that barren sort, who Pyramus presented in their sport, forsook his scene and entered in a break when I did him at this advantage take. <laughs> An ass's knoll I fixed on his head and on his thisby must be answered and forth my mimic comes <laughs> when they him spied <laughs> as wild geese that the creeping fowler eye of russet pated chow chops, many in sort, rising and cawing at the gun's report, sever themselves and madly sweep the sky. <laughs> so at his sight, away his fellows fly, and at our stamp here o'er and o'er one falls. He murder cries and help from Athens calls. <laughs> their sense thus weak, lost with their fears thus strong, made senseless things begin to do them wrong. <laughs> For briars and thorns at their apparel snatch, some sleeves, some hats from year yielders, all things catch. <laughs> I led them on in this distracted fear and left sweet Pyramus translated there. When in that moment, so it came to pass, Titania walked and straightway loved an ass. <laughs> Falls out better than I could devise. But hast thou yet latched the Athenian's eyes with the love juice as I did bid thee to? I took him sleeping. That, that is finished too. And the Athenian woman by his side, that when he waked, of force she must be eyed. <laughs> Stand close. Oh. Stay Well, Well, uh... Sorry, I got a little lost. Uh, enter Hermia and Demetrius. Stand close. This is the same Athenian. Uh, this is the woman, but not this the man. Oh, why rebuke you him that loves you so? Lay breath so bitter on your bitter foe. Now I but chide that I should use thee worse. For thou, I fear, hast given me cause to curse if thou hast slain Lysander in his sleep, being our shoes in blood, plunge in the deep, and kill me too. The sun was not so true to, unto the day as he to me. Would he have stolen away from sleeping Hermia? I'll believe as soon this whole earth may be bored and that the moon may through the center creep and so displease her brother's noontide with antipodes. 
It cannot be, but thou hast murdered him. So should a murderer look so dead, so grim? So should the murdered look, and so should I, pierce through the heart with your stern cruelty. Yet you, the murderer, look as bright, as clear, as yonder Venus in her glimmering sphere. What's this to my Lysander? Where is he? Oh, good Demetrius, wilt thou give him me? I had rather give his carcass to my hounds. Out, dog, out, cur! Thou drivest me past the bows of maiden's patience. Hast thou slain him then? Henceforth be never numbered among men. Oh, once tell true, tell true, even for my sake. Durst thou have looked upon him being awake, and hast thou killed him sleeping? Oh, brave touch, could not a worm, an adder, do so much? An adder did it, for with doubler tongue than thine, thou serpent never adder stung. You spend your passion on a misprized mood. I am not guilty of Lysander's blood, nor is he dead for aught that I can tell. I pray thee, tell me then that he is well. And if I could, what should I get there for? A privilege never to see me more, and from thy hated presence part I so, see me no more, whether he be dead or no. Exit. There is no following her in this fierce vein. Here, therefore, for will I will here, therefore, for I will remain. So sorrow's heaviness, so sorrow's heaviness doth heavier grow, for debt that bankrupt sleep doth sorrow owe, which now in some slight measure it will pay, it for it, it for his tender here I may make some stay. Lies down and sleeps. What hast thou done? Thou hast mistaken quite and laid the love juice on some true love's sight. Of thy misprison must perforce ensue some true love turned and ever false turned true. Then fate or rules that one man holding troth, a million fail, confounding oath on oath. About the wood go swifter than the wind, and Helena of Athens look thou find. All fancy sick she is, and pale of cheer with sighs of love that costs the fresh blood dear. And by some illusion see thou bring her here. I'll charm his eyes again, do she appear. I go, I go, look how I go, swifter than error from the Tartar's bow. Flower of this purple dye, hit with Cupid's archery, sink in apple of his eye when his love he doth espy. Let her shine as gloriously as the Venus of the sky. When thou wakest, if she be by, beg of her for remedy. Re-enter Puck. Captain of our fairy band, Helena is here at hand, and the youth mistook by me pleading for a lover's fee. Shall we their fond pageant see? <laughs> Lord, what fools these mortals be! Stand aside. The noise they make will call Demetrius to awake. Then will two at once woo one. That must needs be sport alone, and those things do best please me that befall preposterously. <laughs> Enter Lysander and Helena. Why should you think that I should woo in scorn? Scorn and derision never come in tears. Look, when I vow I weep, and vow so born in their nativity, all truth appears. How can these things in me seem scorn to you, bearing the badge of faith to prove them true? You do advance your cunning more and more, when truth kills truth, O oh devilish holy fray. These vows are Hermia's. Will you give her o'er? Weigh oath with oath, and will you nothing weigh your vows, vows to her and me? Put it in two scales? Will weigh, and both as light as tails. I had no judgment when to her I swore. Nor none in my mind, now you give her o'er. Demetrius loves her, and he loves not you. <sighs> oh, Helena, goddess, nymph, perfect divine, to what, my love, shall I compare thine eyne? Crystal is muddy. Oh, how ripe and show thy lips, those kissing cherries tempting grow, that pure congealed white, High Taurus snow fanned with the eastern wind turns to a crow. When thou holdest up thy hand, oh, let me kiss this princess of pure white, this seal of bliss. Oh, spite, oh, hell. I see you are all bent to set against me for your merriment. If you were civil and knew courtesy, 
you would not do me such do me thus much injury can you not hate me as i know you do but you must join in souls and mock me too if you were men as men are in show you would not use a gentle lady so to vow and swear and super praise my parts and i am sure you hate me with your hearts both are rivals and love hermia and now both rivals to mock helena a trim exploit a manly enterprise to conjure tears up in a poor maid's eyes with your derision None of noble sort would do so, would so offend a virgin and extort a, pulse, a poor soul's patience all to make you sport. You are unkind, Demetrius, be not so. For you love Hermia, this you know, I know. And here, with all good will, with all my heart, in Hermia's love, I yield you up in part. And yours of Helena to me bequeath, whom I do love and will do till my death. Never did mockers waste more idle breath. Lysander, keep thy Hermia. I will none. If ever I loved her, all that love is gone. My heart to her, but as guest-wise sojourned, and now to Helen is it more is it home returned, there to remain. Helen, it is not so. Disparage not the faith thou dost not know, lest to thy peril thou abide by it dear. Look, where thy love comes, yonder is thy dear. We enter Hermia. Dark night that from the eye his function takes, the ear more quick of apprehension makes, wherein it doth impair the seeing sense, it pays the hearing double recompense. Though art not by mine eye, Lysander found, mine ear, I thank it, brought to me to thy sound, but why unkindly didst thou leave me so? Why should he stay, whom love doth press to go? What love could press Lysander from my side? Lysander's love that would not let him bide, Fair Helena, who more engilds the night than all you fiery oaths and eyes of light, why seekest thou me? Could not this make thee known? The hate I bear thee made me leave so. You speak not as you think it cannot be. Oh, she is one of this confederacy. Now I perceive they have conjoined all three to fashion this false sport in spite of me. Injurious Hermia, most ungrateful maid, have you conspired? Have you with these contrived to bait me in this foul derision? Is all the counsel that we too have shared these sisters' vows, the hours we have spent when we have chid the hasty-footed time for parting us? Oh, is all forgot, all school days friendship, childhood innocence. We, Hermia, like two artificial gods, have with our needles created both one flower, both on one sampler, sitting on one cushion, both warbling of one song, both in one key, as if our hands, our sides, voices, and minds have, have been incorporate. So we grow together, like to a double cherry seeming parted, but yet, and in union, and union in partition, two lovely berries molded on one stem. So with two seeming bodies, but one heart, two of the first like coats in heraldry do, but to one and crowned with one crest. And will you rent our ancient love asunder to join with men in scorning your poor friend? It is not friendly, it is not maidenly. Our sex, as well as I may chide you for it though I alone do feel injury. I am amazed at your passionate words. I scorn you not, it seems that you scorn me. Have you not set Lysander as in scorn to follow me and praise my eyes and face? And made your other love, Demetrius, even but now did spurn me with his foot to call me goddess, nymph, divine and rare, precious and celestial. Therefore speaks he this to her he hates, and therefore doth Lysander deny your love, so rich within his soul, and tender me forsooth affection, by, but by your setting on, by your consent. What, thought I be not so in grace as you, so hung upon with love, so fortunate, but miserable most to love unloved? This is you should pity rather than despise. I understand not what you mean by this. 
I do, her server, counterfeit sad looks, make mouths upon me when I turn my back, wink at each other and hold the sweet jest up. This sport, well carried, shall be chronicled. If you have any pity, grace, or manners, you will not make me such an argument. But fare ye well. Tis partly my own fault, which death or absence shall soon remedy. Stay, gentle Helena. Hear my excuse. My love, my life, my soul, fair Helena. Oh, excellent. Sweet, do not scorn her so. If she cannot entreat, I can compel. Thou canst compel no more than she entreats. Thy treats have no more strength than her weak prayers. Helen, I love thee. By my life I do, I swear by that which I will lose love for thee. To prove him false that says I love thee not. I say I love thee more than he can do. If thou say, withdraw and prove it too. Quick, come. Lysander, where to tends all this? Away, you Ethiope. No, no, he'll seem to break, he'll seem to break loose. Take you on as you would follow, but yet come not. You are a tame man, go. Hang off, thou cat, thou burr, vile thing, let loose, or I will shake thee from me like a serpent. Why are you grown so rude? What changes this sweet love? Thy love! Out, Tawny Tartar, out! Out, loathed medicine, hated potion hints! Do you not just? Yes, to sooth, and so do you. Demetrius, I will keep my word with thee. I would I had your bond, for I perceive a weak bond holds you. I'll not trust your word. What? Should I hurt her? Strike her? Kill her dead? Although I hate her, I harm her not so. What? Can you do me greater harm than hate me? Hate me? Wherefore? Me, what news, my love? Am, am not I Hermia? Are, are not you Lysander? I am as fair now as I was erewhile. Since night you loved me, yet since night you left me. Why then you left me? Oh, the gods forbid, in, in earnest, shall I say? I, by my life, and never did desire to see thee more. Therefore be out of hope, of question, of doubt. Be certain, nothing truer. Tis no jest that I do hate thee and love Helena. No, oh, me. Juggler, you canker blossom, you thief of love, what have you come by night and stolen my love's heart from him? Fine faith. Have you no modesty, no maiden shame, no touch of bashfulness? Will you tear impatient answers from my gentle tongue? Fie, fie, you counterfeit, you puppet, you. Puppet? Why so? I that way goes the game. Now I perceive that she hath made compare. Between our statures, she hath urged her height, and with her personage, her tall personage, her height, forsooth, she hath prevailed with him. And are you grown so high in his esteem because I am so dwarfish and so low? How low am I, thou painted maypole? Speak, how low am I? I am not yet so low, but that my nails can reach unto thine eyes. I pray you, though you mock me, gentlemen, let her not hurt me. I was never cursed. I have no gift at all in shrewishness. I am a right maid for my cowardice. Let her not strike me. You perhaps may think because she is something lower than myself that I can match her. Lower, hark again. Good Hermia, do not be so bitter with me. I evermore did love you. Yeah. Did ever keep your counsels, never wronged you. Save that in love unto Demetrius, I told him of your stealth unto this wood. He followed you, for I, for love I followed him. But he hath chid me hence and threatened me to strike me, spurn me, nay, to kill me too. And now so you will let me quiet go to Athens. Will I bear my folly back and follow you no further? Let me go. You see how simple and how fond I am. Well, I get you gone. Who is it that hinders you? A foolish heart that I leave here behind. What, with Lysander? With Demetrius. Be not afraid. She shall not harm thee, Helena. No, sir, she shall not, though you take her part. When she's angry, she is keen and shrewd. She was a vixen when, she, when we went to school. And though she be but little, she is fierce. Little again, nothing but low and little? Why will you suffer her to flog me thus? Let me come to her. It's you gone, you dwarf. 
You minimus of hindering not grass made, you, you bead, you acorn. You are too officious in her behalf that scorns your services. Let her alone. Speak not of Helena. Take not, part of, take not her part, for if thou dost intend never so little show of love to her, thou shalt abide it. Now she holds me not. Now follow if thou darest to try whose right of thine or mine in most is Helena. Follow? Nay, I'll go with thee, cheek by jowl. Exit Lysander and Demetrius. You mistress, all this coil is long of you. Nay, go not back. I will not trust you. I, nor longer stay in your cursed company. Your hands, then mine, are quicker for a fray. My legs are longer, though, to run away. Exit. I am amazed and not know not what to say. Exit. This is thy negligence. Still thou mistakest or else committest by thy knaveries willfully. Believe me, King of Shadows, I mistook. Did not you tell me I should know the man by the Athenian garment he had on? And so far blameless proves my enterprise that I have anointed an Athenian's eyes. And so far am I glad it so did sword as this their jangling I esteem a sport. Thou seest these lovers seek a place to fight. Hi, therefore, Robin, overcast the night. The starry well can cover over thou anon with drooping fog as black as Acheron, and lead these testy rivals so astray as one comes not within another's way. Let to Lysander sometimes frame thy tongue, then stir Demetrius up with bitter wrong, and sometimes rail thou like Demetrius, and from each other look thou, lead them thus, till o'er the brows death counterfeit his sleep with leaden legs and batty wings doth creep. Then crush this herb into Lysander's eye, whose liquor hath this virtuous property, to take from thence all error with his might, and make his eyeballs roll with wanton sight. And then, uh, when they next wake, all this derision shall from seem a dream and fruitless vision. And back to Athens shall the lovers wend, with, and with league whose date till death shall never end. Whilst I in this affair do thee employ, I'll to my queen and beg her Indian boy. And then I will her charmed eyes release from monsters view, and all things shall be peace. My fairy lord, this must be done with haste, for night swift dragons cut the clouds full fast, and yonder shines Aurora's harbinger, at whose approach ghosts wandering here and there troop home to churchyards, damned spirits all, that in crossways and floods have burial already to their wormy beds are gone. For fear lest day should look their shames upon, they willfully themselves exile from light and must for aye concert with black-browed night. But we are spirits of another sort. I, with the morning's love, have oft made sport, and like a forester the groves may tread even till the eastern gate, all fiery red, opening on Neptune with fair blessed beams, turns into yellow gold his salt-green streams. Notwithstanding, haste, make no, del no delay. We may affect this business yet ere day. Exit. Up and down, up and down. I will lead them up and down. I am feared in field and town. Goblin, lead them up and down. Here comes one. Re-enter Lysander. Where art thou, proud Demetrius? Speak thou now. Here, villain, drawn and ready. Where art thou? I will be with thee straight. Follow me then to plainer ground. Exit Lysander, following the voice, re-enter Demetrius. Lysander, speak again. Thou runaway, thou coward, art thou fled? Speak, in some bush, where dost thou hide thy head? Thou coward, art thou bragging to the stars, telling the bushes that thou lookst for wars and wilt not come? Come, recreant, come, thou child, I'll whip thee with a rod. He is defiled that draws a sword on thee. Yea, art thou there? Follow my voice, we'll try no manhood here. Exeunt, re-enter Lysander. He goes before me and still dares me on. When I come where he calls, then he is gone. The villain is much lighter healed than am I. I followed fast, but faster he did fly. That fallen am I in dark, uneven way, and here will rest me. Lies down. Come, thou gentle day. For if but once thou show me thy gray light, I'll find Demetrius and revenge this spite. Sleeps. Re-enter Puck and Demetrius. Ho, oh, 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 coward, why comest thou not? Abide me, if thou darest, for well I wot. Thou runnest before me, shifting every place, and darest not stand, nor look me in the face. Where art thou now? Come hither, I am here. 
Nay, then you mockest me. Thou shalt buy this dear, if ever I thy face by daylight see. Now go thy way. Faintness constraineth me to measure out my length on this cold bed. By day's approach, look to be visited. Lies down and sleeps. Re-enter Helena. Oh, weary night. A oh, long and tedious night. Abate thy hour. Shine comforts from the east that I may back to Athens by daylight from these that my poor company detest. And sleep that sometimes shut up so shuts up sorrow's eye. Steal me a while from mine own company. Lies down and sleeps. Yet but three? Come one more. Two of both kinds make up four. Here she comes, cursed and sad. Cupid is a knavish lad, thus to make poor females mad. Re-enter Hermia. Never so weary, never so in woe, bedabbled with the dew and torn with briars. I can no further crawl, no further go. My legs can keep no pace with my desires. Here will I rest me till the break of day. Heaven shield Lysander if they mean a fray. Lies down and sleeps. On the ground, sleep sound. I'll apply to your eye, gentle lover, remedy. Squeezing. When thou wakest, thou takest true delight in the sight of thy former lady's eye. And the country proverb known that every man should take his own in your waking shall be shown. Jack shall have Jill, not shall go ill. The man shall have his mare again, and all shall be well. Exit, and the act is over. <clears throat> act four, scene one. The same, Lysander, Demetrius, Helena, and Hermia lying asleep. Enter Ty uh, Tatiana and Bottom, Peas, uh, Peas bottom, cobweb, moth, mustard seed, and other fairies attending. Oberon behind unseen. Come, sit thee down upon this flowery bed while I thy amiable cheeks do coy and stick musk roses in thy sleek smooth head and kiss thy fair large ears, my gentle joy. Where's Peas blossom? Ready. Scratch my head. P, uh, peas Blossom. Where's Monsieur Cobweb? Ready. Monsieur Cobweb, good Monsieur, get your weapons in your hand and kill me a red-hipped humble bee on top of a thistle. And good Monsieur, if you could bring me the honey bag, do not fret yourself too much in the action, Monsieur. And good Monsieur, have have a care in the honey bag, break not. <laughs> I would loathe to have you overflown with a honey bag, Seigneur. Where's Monsieur Mustard Seed? Ready. Give me your neef, Monsieur Mustard Seed. <laughs> Pray you, <laughs> leave your curse, Mr. Monsieur. Oh, I don't... What's your will? Nothing, good Monsieur. But to help Calvary Cobweb to scratch, I'm, I must to the barbers, Monsieur. For methinks I am marvelously hairy about the face and I am such a tender ass. If my hair do tickle me, I must scratch. What, wilt thou hear some music, my sweet love? I have a reasonable good ear for music. Let's have the tongs and bones. Or say, sweet love, what thou desirest to eat. Truly, a peck of provender. I could munch on your good dry oats. Methinks I have a great desire to do a bottle of hay, good hay. Sweet hay hath no fellow. I have a venturous fairy that shall seek the squirrel's hoard and fetch thee new nuts. I'd rather have a handful or two of dried peas, but I pray you, let none of your people stir me. I have an exposition of sleep to come upon me. Sleep thou, and I will wind thee in my arms. Fairies, be gone, and be always away. Exunt fairies. So doth the woodbine, the sweet honeysuckle gently entwist, the female ivy sow and wrings the barky fingers of the elm. Oh, how I love thee, how I dote on thee. They sleep. Enter Puck. Welcome, good Robin. 
Seest thou this sweet sight? Her dotage now I do begin to pity. For meeting her of late behind the woods, seeking sweet favors from this hateful fool, I did upbraid her and fall out with her, for she has his hairy temples, then had rounded with a coronet of fresh and fragrant flowers, and that same dew which sometime on the buds was wont to swell like round and orient pearls, stood now within the pretty flowerets' eyes like tears that did their own disgrace bewail. When I had by pleasure taunted her, and she in mild terms begged my patience, I then did ask of her her changeling child, which straight away she gave me, and her fairy sent to bear him to my bower in fairyland. Now I have the boy, I will undo this hateful imperfection of her eyes, and, gentle pup, take this transformed scalp from off the head of this Athenian swain, that he, awaking when the other do, may all to Athens back and again repair, and think no more of this night's accidents, but as a fierce vexation of a dream. But first, I will release the fairy queen. Be thou wast wont to be. See as thou wast wont to see. Diane's bud or cupid flower hath such force and blessed power. Now, my Titania, wake you, my sweet queen. My Oberon, what visions have I seen? Methought I was enamored of an ass. <laughs> there lies your love. How came these things to pass? Oh, how mine eyes do loathe his visage now. Silence a while. Robin, take off his head. Titania, music call. And strike more dead than come and sleep of all these five the scents. Music, ho, oh, music, such as charmeth sleep. Music, still. Now when thou wakest, with thine own fool's eyes peep. Sound music. Come, my queen, take hands with me, and rock the ground whereupon these sleepers be. Now thou and I are new in amity, and will tomorrow midnight solemn, solemnly dance in Duke Theseus' house triumphantly, and bless it to all fair prosperity. There shall the pair of faithful lovers be wedded with Theseus, all in jollity. Fairy king, attend, and mark, I do hear the morning lark. Then, my queen, in silence sad, trip we after the night's shade. We the globe can compass soon, swifter than the wandering moon. Come, my lord, and in our flight tell me how it came this night that I sleeping here was found with these mortals on the ground. Exeunt, horns winded within. Enter Theseus, Hippolyta, and uh, Aegeus, and train. Go, one of you. Find the forester, for now our observation is performed. And since we have the vowed of the day, my love shall hear the music of my hounds. Uncouple in the western valley, let them go. Dispatch, I say, and find the forester. Exeunt, an attendant. We will, fair queen, up to the mountain's top and mark the musical confusion of hounds and echo in conjunction. I looked with Hercules and Cadmus once. When in a wood of Crete they bade the bear with hounds of Sparta, never did I hear such gallant chiding. For, besides the grooves, the skies, the fountains, every region near seemed all one mutual cry. I never heard so musical a discord, such a sweet thunder. My hounds are bred out of the Spartan kind, so flued, so sanded, and their heads are hung with ears that sweep away the morning dew. Crook kneed and dew lapped like Thessalian bulls, slow in pursuit, but matched in mouth like bells, each under each. A cry more tunable was never hollered to nor cheered with horn in Crete, in Sparta, nor in Thessaly. Judge when you hear, but soft, what nymphs are these? My lord, this is my daughter here asleep, and this Lysander, this Demetrius is, this. Helena, old natives, Helena. I wonder of their being here together. No doubt they rose up early to observe the rite of May, and hearing our intent came here in grace, our solemnity. Uh, but speak, Aegeus, is not this the day that Hermia should give answer of her choice? It is, my lord. Go, bid the hum huntsmen wake them with their horns. Horns and, sh and shout within. Lysander, Demetrius, Helena, and Hermia, wake and start up. Good morrow, friends. St. Valentine is past. Begin these wood birds but to couple now. Pardon, my lord? 
I pray you all stand up. I know you two are rival enemies. How come this gentle discord into the world and hatred is so far from jealousy to sleep by hate and fear no enmity? My lord, I shall reply amazedly, half sleep, half waking, but as yet I swear I cannot truly say how I came here. But as I think for truly what I speak, and now I do bethink me, so it is. I came with Hermia hither. Our intent was to be gone from Athens where we might without the peril of the Athenian law. Enough, enough, my lord, you have enough. I beg the law, the law upon his head. They would have stolen away, they would, Demetrius, thereby to have defended you and me, you of your wife and me of my consent, of my consent that she should be your wife. My lord, fair Helen told me of their stealth, of this their purpose hither to this wood, and I in fury hither followed them, fair Helena in fancy following me. But my good lord, I wot not by what power, melted as the snow seems to me now, as the remembrance of an idle god, which in my childhood I did dote upon, and all the faith, the virtue of my heart, the object and the pleasure of mine eye, is only Helena. To her, my lord, was I betrothed ere I saw Hermia. But like in sickness did I loathe this food, but as in health come to my natural taste, now I do wish it, love it, long for it, and will forevermore be true to it. Fair lovers, you are fortunately met. Of this discourse, we more will hear anon. Aegeus, I will overbear your will, for in the temple by and by with us, these couples shall eternally be knit. And for the morning now is something worn. Our purposed hunting shall be set aside. Away with us to Athens, three and three. Behold a feast in great solemnity. Come, Hippolyta. Exunt, Theseus, Hippolyta, Aegeus, and Train. These things seem small and in, un, undistinguishable. Methinks I see these things with parted eye when everything seems double. So methinks, and I have found Demetrius like a jewel, mine own and not mine own. Are you sure that we are awake? It seems to me that yet we sleep, we dream. Do not you think the Duke was here and bid us follow him? Yea, and my father. And Hippolyta. And he did bid us follow to the temple. Why then, we are awake. Let's follow him, and by the way, let us recount our dreams. Exunt. Uh, when my cue comes, call me, and I will answer. My next is, my most fair Pyramus, hi-ho. Peter Quince, flute the bellows mender, snout the tinker, starveling. Gods, my life stolen hence and left me sleep. I have a most rare vision. I have had a dream, past wit of man to say what dream it, it was. Man is an ass if he go about to expound the dream. Methought I was. There is no man that can tell me what. Me thought I was, and me thought I had. But man is a patched fool. If he will offer to say what me thought I had, the eye of man hath not heard, the ear of man hath not seen, the man's hand is not able to taste, his tongue to conceive, nor his heart to report what, dr what my dream was. I will go get Peter Quince to write a ballad of this dream. It shall be called bottom's dream because it hath no bottom and i will sing it like the ladder at the end of a play before the duke per adventure to make it the more gracious gracious i shall sing it at her death exit scene two athens queen's house enter Keats, flute snout and starveling have you sent to bottom's house has he come home yet he cannot be heard of out of doubt, he is transported. Uh, if he come not, uh, then the play is marred. It goes not forward, doth it? It is not possible. You have not a man in all of Athens able to discharge Pyramus, but he. No, he hath simply the best wit of any handicraft man in Athens. Yes, and the best person, too. He is a very paramour for a sweet voice. 
You, you must say paragon. A paramour is, God bless us, a thing of naught. Enter snug. Masters, the duke is coming from the temple, and there is two or three lords and ladies more married. If our sport had gone forward, we had all been made men. Oh, sweet bully bottom. Thus hath lost sixpence a day during his life. He could not have escaped sixpence a day, and the duke had not given him sixpence a day for playing the pyramus. I'll be hanged. He would have deserved it. Sixpence a day in pyramus or nothing. Enter Bottom. Where are these lads? Where are these hearts? Oh, Bottom, oh, most courageous day, oh, most happy hour. Masters, I am to discourse wonders, but ask me not what, for if I tell you I am no true Athenian, I will tell you everything, right as it fell out. Let us hear, sweet Bottom. Not a word of me. All that I will tell you is that the Duke hath dined. Get your apparel together, good strings to your beards, new ribbons to your pumps. Meet presently at the palace. Every man look o'er his part, for short and the long is, our play is preferred. In any case, let Thisbe have clean linen, and let him not the play that plays the lion pare his nails, for they shall hang out for the lion's claws. And, most dear actors, eat no onions nor garlic, for we are to utter sweet breath. And I do not doubt but to hear them say it is a sweet comedy. No more words. Away! Go away! Exeunt. Act five, scene one, Athens, the place of Theseus. Enter Theseus, Hippolyta, Philostrate, lords in attendance. Tis strange, my Theseus, that these lovers speak of. More strange than true. I never may believe these antique fables, nor these fairy toys. Lovers and madmen have such seething brains, such shaping fantasies that apprehend more than cool reason ever comprehends. The lunatic, the lover, and the poet all are of imagination all compact. One more sees more devils than vast hell can hold. That is the madman. The lover, all is frantic, sees Helen's beauty in the brow of Egypt. The poet's eye, in fine frenzy rolling, doth glance from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven, and as imagination bodies forth, the forms of things unknown, the poet's pen turns into shapes and gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. Such tricks have strong imagination, that if it would but apprehend some joy, it comprehends some bringer of that joy. Or, in the night imagining some fear, how easy is a bush supposed to bear? But all the story of the night told over, and all their minds transfigured so together, more witnesses than fancied images, and grows to something of great con constancy. But however so, strange and admirable. Here come the lovers. Full of joy and mirth. Enter joy, Lysander. gentle. Fr oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Enter Lysander, Demetrius, Hermia, and Helena. Joy, gentle friends. Joy and fresh days of love accompany your hearts. More than to us wait in your royal walks, your board and your bed. Come now. What masks, what dances shall we have to wear away this long age of three hours between our after supper and bedtime? Where is our usual manager of mirth? What revelers are in what revels are in hand? Is there no play to ease the anguish of a torturing hour? Call Philistrate. Here, mighty Theseus. Say, what abridgment have you for this evening? What mask? What music? How shall we beguile the lazy time if not with some delight? There is a brief how many sports are ripe. Make choices of which your highness will see first. Give me a paper. The battle with the centaurs to be sung by an Athenian eunuch to the harp. Well, none of that. That have I told my love and glory of my kinsman Hercules. <coughs> Reads. The riot of the tipsy bacchanals, tearing the Thracian singer in their rage. That is an old device. And it was played when I from Thebes came last a conqueror. Reads. 
the thrice three muses mourning for the death of learning late deceased in beggary. That is some satire, keen and critical, not sorting with a nuptial ceremony. Reads. A tedious brief scene of young Pyramus and his love, Thisbe. Very tragical mirth. Very and tragical, tedious and brief. That is hot ice and wondrous strange snow. Here shall we find the concord of this discord. How shall, sorry, how shall we find the concord of this discord? A play there is, my lord, some ten words long, which is as brief as I have known a play. But by ten words, my lord, it is too long, which makes it tedious. For in all the play there is not one word apt, a player fitted, and tragical, my lord, it is. For Pyramus therein doth kill himself, which uh, when I saw rehearsed, I must confess, made my eyes water. But more merry tears the passion of loud laughter never tried. What are they that do play it? Hard-handed men that work in Athens here, which never labored in their minds till now, now have toiled their unbreathed memories which uh, with this same play against your nuptials. And we will hear it. No, my noble lord, it is not for you. I have heard it over and it is nothing, nothing in the world, unless you can find some sport in their interests, extremely stretched and conned with cruel pain to do you service. I will hear that play. But never anything can be amiss when simpleness and duty tender it. Go, bring them in, and uh, take your places, ladies. Exit Philistrate. I love not to see wretchedness o'ercharged and duty in a service perishing. Why, gentle, sweet, you shall see no such thing. He says they can do nothing in this kind. The kinder we to give them thanks for nothing. Our sport shall be to take what they mistake. And what poor duty cannot do, noble respect, takes it in might, not merit. Where I have come, great clerks have purposed to greet me with premeditated welcomes. Where I have seen them shiver and look pale, make periods in the midst of sentences, throttle their practiced accent in their fears, and in conclusion, dumbly have broke off, not paying me a welcome. Trust me, sweet, after, out of this silence, yet I picked a welcome. And in the modesty of fearful duty, I read as much from the rattling tongue of saucy and audacious eloquence. Love, therefore, and tongue-tied simplicity in least speak most to my capacity. Re-enter so, Philistrate. So please your grace, the prologue is addressed. <laughs> Let him approach. <laughs> Enter Quince for the prologue. If we offend, it is with our good will that you should think we come not to offend, but with good will to show our simple skill that is the true beginning of our end. Consider then we come but to, in spite, uh, we do not come as minding to content you are, our true intent is all for your delight. We are not here that you should hear repent. You the actors are at hand and by their show, you shall know all that you are like to know. This fellow doth not stand upon points. He hath rid his prologue like a rough colt. He knows not the stop. A good moral, my lord. It is not enough to speak, but to speak true. Indeed, he hath played on his prologue like a child on a recorder. A sound, but not in government. His speech was like a tangled chain. Nothing impaired, but all dis disordered. Who's next? Enter. Pyramus and Thisbe, Wall, Moonshine, and Lion. Kind of harsh, but okay. Gentles, perchance you wonder at this show, but wonder on, till truth make all things plain. This man is Pyramus, if you would know. This beauteous lady, Thisbe, is certain. This man with lime and rough calf does present Wall. That vile wall which did these lover lovers sunder and through walls chink 
poor souls they are content to whisper at the which let no man wonder this man with lantern dog and bush of thorn presenteth moonshine for you will know by moonshine did these lovers think no scorn to meet at ninia's tomb there there to woo this grisly beast which lion hight by name the trusty thisbe coming first by night did scare away or rather did affright and as she fled her mantle she did fall which lion vile with bloody mouth did stain adon comes pyramus sweet youth and tall and finds his trust trusty thisbe's mantle slain rat with blade with bloody blameful blade he bravely broached his boiling bloody breast and thisbe tearing in the mulberry shade his dagger drew and died for all the rest let lion moonshine wall and lovers twain at large discourse here while they do remain exeunt prologue thisbe lion and moonshine i wonder if the lion be to speak no wonder my lord one lion may when many asses do in this same interlude it doth befall that i one snout by name present a wall and such a wall as i would have you think that had in it a crannied hole or or chink uh through which the lovers pyramus and thisbe did whisper often very secretly this loam this rough cast and this stone doth show that i am that same wall the truth is so and this the cranny is right and sinister through which the fearful lovers are to Whisper, shh. Would you desire lime and hair to speak better? It is the wittiest partition that ever I heard discourse, my lord. Enter Pyramus. Pyramus draws near the wall. Silence. Pyramus. That's bottom. Joe Stern. Bottom. Joe, you're on mute. Yeah, I apologize. Um, I totally got uh, lost. Are we? Good. Um, uh, o Grim look tonight. Do do uh, control F. O yes. O and Grim. Oh. Sorry about this. You got it. Yeah, that's not coming up. Though. No, O, o space G R I M. O space G R I M. O Grim. Oh. I'm happy to cue you again with my wall speech. <laughs> I can cue you again with my little. Oh. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, Grim looked night. Oh, night with hue so black. Is that the right one? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Okay. This is rock and roll. Yep. O night, which ever art when day is not. O night, O night, alack, alack. I fear my Thisbe's promise forgot. And thou, O wall, O sweet, O lovely wall, thou standest between her father's ground and mind. Thou wall, <clears throat> O wall, O sweet loving wall, show me thy clink to blink through with mine eye. Wall holds up his fingers. Or her finger. Thanks, courte courteous wall. Jove shield thee well for this. But what I see, no Thisbe do I see. O wicked wall, through whom I see no bliss. Cursed be thy stones for, for thus deceiving me. The wall methinks being sensible should curse again. Am I going to keep reading Pyramus here? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, no, in truth, sir, he should not. Deceiving me is Thisbe's cue. She is to enter now, and I am to spy her through the wall. You shall see, and it will fall pat as I told you. Yonder she comes. Enter Thisbe. Oh, wall, full often hast thou heard my moans for parting my fair Pyramus and me. My cherry lips have often kissed thy stones, thy stones with lime and hair knit up in thee. 
questions for us. I see a voice. Now will I to <clears throat> now will I to the chink to spy and I can hear thy my Fisbee's face. Fisbee. My love thou art, my love I think. Think what shall wilt. I am thy lover's grace, and like Lymander, I am trusty still. And I like heaven till the fates me kill. Not Shaphalus to Procris was so true. As Shaphalus to Pro Procris, I to you. Oh, kiss me through the hole of this vile wall. I kiss the wall's hole and not your lips at all. Wilt thou ninnies to meet me straight away? Tide life, tide death, I come without delay. Exeunt, Pyramus and Thisbe. Thus have I, wall, my part discharged so, and being done, thus wall, away doth go. Exit. Now is the mural down between the two neighbors. No remedy, my lord, when walls are so willful to hear without warning. This is the silliest stuff that I ever heard. <laughs> the best in this kind are but shadows, and the worst are no worse, if imagination amend them. It must be your imagination, then, and not theirs. If we imagine no worse than their, of them and they of themselves, they may pass for excellent men. Here come two noble beasts, and a man and a lion. Enter lion and moonshine. You ladies, you, whose gentle hearts do fear the smallest, monstrous mouse that creeps on the floor, may now, perchance, both quake and tremble here. When lion rough in wildest rage doth roar, then know that I, once snug the joiner, am a lion fell, nor else no lion's dam. For if I should as lion come in strife into this place, were pity on my life. A very gentle beast of a good conscience. The very best at a beast, my lord, as e'er I saw. This lion is a very fox for his valor. <laughs> True, and a goose for his discretion. Not so, my lord, for his valor cannot carry his discretion, and the fox carries the goose. His discretion, I am sure, cannot carry his valor, for the goose carries not the fox. It is well. Leave it to his discretion, and let us listen to the moon. This lantern doth the horned moon present. He should have worn the horns on his head. He is no crescent, and his horns are invisible within the circumference. This lantern doth the horned moon present. Myself the man in the moon do seem to be. This is the greatest error of all the rest. The man should be put into the lanthorn. How is it else the man in the moon? He dares not come there for the candle, for, you see, it is already in snuff. I am a weary of this moon. Would he would change? It appears by his small light of discretion that he is in the way. But yet in courtesy and all reason, we must stay the time. Proceed, moon! All I have to say is to tell you that the lanthorn is the moon. I, the man in the moon, this thorn bush, my thorn bush, and this dog, my dog. <laughs> Why all these should be in the lantern, for all these are in the moon. But silence, here comes Thisbe. Enter Thisbe. This is old Ninny's tomb. Where is my love? <laughs> ah! Thisbe runs off. Well roared, lion. Well run, Thisbe. Well shown, moon. Truly, the moon shines with a good grace. Well, the lion, the lion shakes his Thisbe's mantle and exit. Well, mouse lion. And so the lion vanished. And then came Pyramus. Enter Pyramus. You're on mute, Jill. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, sweet moon, I thank thee for thy sunny beams i thank thee moon for shining now so bright for thy gracious golden glittering gleams i trust to take the truest thisbe sight but stay o oh spite but mark poor knight what dreadful dole is here eyes do you see how can it be oh dainty duck oh dear thy mantle good what 
stained with blood, approach ye furies fell. O fate, come, come, cut thread and thrum, quail, crush, conclude, and quell. This passion in the death of a dear friend would go near to make a man look sad. Be true my heart, but I pity the man. Oh, wherefore, nature, did thou liest lions frame, since lion vile hath here deflowered, my dear, which is no, no, which was the fairest dame that ever lived, that loved, that liked, that looked with cheer. Come, tears confound, out sword, and wound thy pap of Pyramus, I that left pap, where thou art hop. <clears throat> Thus I die, thus, thus, thus. I am now dead, I am now fled. My soul in the sky, tongue loose, thy light, moon take thy light. Now die, 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 die. Dies. <laughs> no die, but an ace for him, for he is but one. Less than ace, man, for he's dead, he's, he's nothing. With the help of a surgeon, he might yet recover and prove an ass. How chance Moonshine is gone before Thisbe comes back and finds her lover? She will find him by starlight. Here she comes, and her passion ends the play. Re-enter Thisbe. Methinks she should not use a long one for such pyramids. I hope she will be brief. A moat will turn the balance which pyramids, which Thisbe is the better. He for a man, God warrant us. She for a woman, God bless us. She hath spied him already with those sweet eyes. And thus she means vedelect, or vedelicit. Uh, Asleep, my love? What? Dead, my, my dove? Oh, Pyramus, arise. Speak, speak, quite dumb. Dead, dead. A tomb must cover thy sweet eyes. These my lips, this cherry nose, this yellow cowslip cheeks are gone, are gone. Lovers make moan, his eyes were green as leeks. Oh, sisters three, come, come to me with hands as pale as milk, lay them in gore since you have shore with tears his thread of silk. Tongue, not a word, come. Trusty sword, come, blade, my breast in brew. <laughs> no. and, and farewell, friends. Thus, this be ends. Adieu, adieu, adieu. Dies. Moonshine and lion are left to bury the dead. Aye, and the wall, too. <laughs> <laughs> no, assure you, the wall is down that parted their fathers. Will it please you to see the epilogue or hear a burgomasque dance between two of our company? No epilogue, I pray you, for your play needs no excuse. Never excuse, for when the players are all dead, there needs none to be blamed. Marry, if he that rid it had played Pyramus and hanged himself in Thisbe's garter, it would have been a fine tragedy. And so it is, truly, and a very notably discharged. But come, your burgomask, let your epilogue alone. The anthem of midnight, twelve hours today, it's almost fairy time. I fear we shall outsleep the coming morn as much as this palpable growth, gross play hath well beguiled the heavy gate of night. Sweet friends, to bed a fortnight hold we this solemnity. In night revels a new jollity. Exeunt. Enter Puck. Nick. Mute. On you're mute. on mute, Nick. Nick, your microphone is off. There you go. Oh, come on. Now the hungry lion roars, and the wolf behowls the moon. 
whilst the heavy plowman snores, all with weary task foredone. Now the wasted brands do glow, whilst the screech owl, screeching loud, puts the wretch that lies in woe in remembrance of a shroud. Now it is the time of night that the graves all gaping wide, every one lets forth his sprite in the churchway paths to glide, and we fairies that do run by the triple Hecate's team from the presence of the sun following darkness like a dream. Now our frolic, not a mouse, shall disturb this hallowed house. I am sent with broom before to sweep the dust behind the door. Enter Oberon and Titiana, Titania, sorry, with their train. Through the house give gathering light by the dead and drowsy fire. Every elf and fairy sprite hop as light as bird from briar, and this ditty after me sing and dance it trippingly. First, rehearse your song by rote, to each word a warbling note. Hand in hand with fairy grace, we will sing and bless this place. <laughs> Now until the break of day, through this house each fairy stray, to the best bride bed will we which by us shall blessed be, and the issue there create shall be ever fortunate. So shall all the couples three ever true in loving be, and the blots of nature's hand shall not in their issue stand. Never mole, hair lip, nor scar, nor mark prodigious such as our despised in nativity shall upon their children be. With this field you consecrate, every fairy take his gate, and each several chambers bless through this palace with sweet peace, and the owner of it blessed shall ever in safety rest. Trip away, make no stay, meet me all by break of day. Exeunt, Oberon, Titania, and Train. If we shadows have offended, think but this, and all is mended that you have but slumbered here while these visions did appear. And this weak and idle theme, no more yielding, but a dream. Gentles, do not reprehend. If you pardon, we will mend. And as I am an honest puck, if we have unearned luck, now to scape the serpent's tongue, we will make amends ere long. Else the puck a liar call. So good night unto you all. Give me your hands, if we be friends, and Robin shall restore amends. End. <laughs> yes! Nice. We nice have been the quarantine the players. <laughs> I shall read the roles uh, as they were presented to you. Uh, playing Puck was Nick Napo. The role of Oberon is played by John Anthony Lopez. Titania, Lisa Spielman, Lysander, Jonathan Masiska, Demetrius, Kevin Thompson, Hermia, Seven, Sarah Paris, Paris, I just said that before. Persisepi, Helena, Abigail, Hubbard, Dar Darren? Darren. Aaron, I, I've, read, I've read these names, never said them. Aegeus, Keith Gilroy, Theseus, Bruce Crilly, Hippolyta, Ari Spence, Nick Bottom, Ralph Jean Pierre, and Joe Stern, Peter Quince, Stevie Rowe, Francis Flute, Andrea Romano, Robin Starv Starveling, Wesley Richard, and Sam Nagin, Tom Snout, Tori Smith, Snug, Marissa Lauren, Phyllis Strait, James Heisey, Pease Blossom, David Himmel, Cobweb, Kaylee Reichman, Moth, Erica Jean Soto, Mustard Seed, Bridget Emsworth, Act 1 Stage Directions, Heather Curran, Act 2 Stage Directions, Bridget Emsworth, Act 3 Stage Directions, Sam Negan, Act 4 Stage Directions, Joe Stern, Act 5 Stage Directions, Milan Sofer. My name is Michael Serpy. Thank you and good night. Hey, Michael.